everybody. So today we are at the Alliance Performance Center. It's also the home of the Bat Busters and the Firecracker organizations, but most of all, it's the Alliance Performance Center because we got a lot of dynamic things going on. And I use that word dynamic because we're talking with Stratton Kim today of Dynamic Athletics. And so Stratton's been here. He's been a fixture as part of this facility for a few years now. And I want to talk a little bit with him about the background of Dynamic Athletics. But one of the things that we really want to offer you is just a little bit different perspective on just training. So training itself can be like, an, not an overused term, but it's a general term that a lot of people kind of fall into the same type of, we call it like the same oat bag, but there's a lot of different things happening here. I've been fortunate enough to be part of this facility for the last six months, and I've been watching <coughs> what you guys have been doing over here, and it is dynamic. It's really, really cool. So today, Stratton, I want to welcome you here and actually you. welcome you to your own place. So yeah. I guess I'm the one that's welcome or unwelcome. Uh, either, either way. Either yeah, way. I mean, you know. But uh, thanks for being here. And you and, I, you and I have had some really good conversations. And, you know, for me, I just feel like it's a responsibility to pass some things on. So before we get into the topic of the day, <clears throat> which is the big toe. Yes. We'll explain that here in a minute. Sounds Let's talk weird, a little but... bit about uh, DA, about dynamic athletics. So, you know, when did it start? Who are the founders and how did it all happen? And how'd you end up in this place? So as he said, my name's Stratton Kim. I've been uh, with dynamic athletics for four years since it opened. Um, they're going on four years now. So DA kind of came about because we wanted to kind of do training a little bit differently. Um, we wanted to kind of do training in what we kind of think is a better way to do training. So Mike uh, Stith and Mark Campbell were the ones that kind of started the whole business. Uh, Mark Campbell was kind of the guy that was like, hey, we need to do this different. So he kind of had this idea of starting this new um, training company and I kind of got in on the ground level. So we got in, talked with Mike and Deanna and Mark and they kind of were like, hey, this is what we have. This is the facility. This is the equipment. Let us know what you need. But other than that, Training's yours. So, so the term dynamic is, is changing and progressing, right? And so it's really an appropriate term that wasn't necessarily original, the original part of their vision, but something you kind of brought in, because to <clears throat> me, that's what makes this stand out. So, I mean, I don't know what their philosophy was or why they picked dynamic athletics. We haven't had that conversation, which is probably a conversation we should probably have. Um, but the way when they told us this is what it is, this, this is what it's gonna be called. I ran with it, I liked it, and I, and I agree with you. I, I think the word dynamic, <clears throat> it means changing, it means different things. So um, when I got that, it was like, okay, hey, what do we wanna do different? I had just graduated college at this time too, so. But you, um, knew, you knew that you were a little different in your perspective already, yes, right? Before yes. you really got your hands um, on Because, it. I mean, just to give you guys a little background on how I got into the industry, um, you know, I was a baseball guy. I played baseball for, for 15 years. I played at the college level at Cal State San Bernardino. I was a catcher. Um, but my senior year in high school and my sophomore year in college, I, was, I had surgery on, on my shoulders. I tore my labrum in both my shoulders. Uh, my, so or my senior year was my left one. My sophomore year in college was my right one. So that's kind of how I got into this because I went to rehab and I enjoyed the rehab process. I enjoyed the rehab process of lifting weights, of getting stronger. Yes. Um, the whole process of getting there, obviously, and being hurt is not fun. It's never fun being on, on the sideline. But um, the rehab process for me was fun. I enjoyed talking to my therapists and understanding, hey, what, what's going on? Why are we doing this? Why is this exercise important? You know, and I enjoyed the process of going through the weeks and getting stronger as the weeks went on and then going through a, a throwing process and things like that. And so once I knew that that was something that I could do for a career, that's what kind of opened my eyes. And I knew, then I started learning that kinesiology was a degree. I went to college and played baseball, got hurt again, went through more rehab. And then I decided that, hey, baseball probably wasn't gonna be my path, but I got really into school. Sure. I got really into school. I enjoyed going to class. I enjoyed learning. And then it became about my junior, senior year in college. I was like, you know what? I wanna get a master's, mm -hmm. um, which when I went to college, I wanted to play ball, get drafted, go to the major leagues, make a lot of money. Yeah. but that doesn't always happen. Right. Um, Sometimes those dreams just take a, a sharp so, left or something. It's where we end up. Exactly. So when you were a patient, excuse me, when you were a patient, did you find yourself questioning or asking why or watching how things were doing yes. or, or how, why people were doing things the way they were doing? Yeah. That's, yeah. And I mean, even not just myself, I would watch them work with other patients. I would watch them and, you know, and that was interesting to me. And then, like I said, once I knew kinesiology was a major, I was one of the lucky people in the world that go into college knowing what they want to do. 
went and got my master's. I worked in PT for a couple years in college. And then ever since I graduated college, I've been doing strength and conditioning. So I graduated 2015. So, you know, I've been doing strength and conditioning for about seven years now, um, eight years. And I love every second of it. Right. Um, and that's kind of like you said, did I know I was a little bit different? Um, a little bit, you know, I just, I, I enjoy, I enjoy things that a lot of people don't really focus on. Um, like you said, the topic of today is the big toe. I enjoy those things. Right. Um, you know, the mirror muscles, the abs, the pecs, the shoulders, all that stuff's cool, yeah. but that's not really gonna make you a better athlete. You, you seem to look at everybody as their, everyone is their own canvas. And every player that you work with, even when they have a, kind of a, a, a general plan, but you're, you're specifying your training with them. Yeah. And so it's, I watch you invest and you have an interest in the people that come in here and train. So it seems very important that you're not just putting them through something Correct. That's general, but Correct. you're looking for specific development. Well, yeah, and, and as you well know, everyone is different. Every person, yes, we all have a, a femur on both sides. We all have a tibia on both sides. We all have these bones that everyone has. But in the same way, my bones are different than yours because I may have shorter or longer bones, right? My insertion points of my muscles may be at different points on my bone. It's the same muscle that you have, mm -hmm. but where they insert, where they, where they originate makes me coaching an exercise a little bit different for you than myself or you compared to someone else because of those points. Those right. muscles are shorter, longer. They have different angles, things like that, right. that all make coaching, say, a one-arm dumbbell row, a very basic exercise, a little bit different. Right. And depending on what sport they play. Right. You know, obviously we deal with a lot of softball mm -hmm. and they're overhead athletes. They gotta be able to throw a ball. Right. You know, we need good scapular motion on the rib cage. Right. So when we row, I'm not gonna teach them just to lock the shoulder down and then just row here because then we get no scapular motion. Right. Um, so taking into account the sport that that athlete plays as well as their own individual biomechanics of the way their body moves, yeah. those things are all um, things that I take into account when I look at an athlete. Like we talked the other day, there are specific exercises, right? So there's basic things such as a squat, a deadlift, a lunge, a, a press, a pull. General terms that most people know. General things that, you know, you're gonna walk into any weight room across the world and you're gonna see those, those things. You're gonna see people squatting, you're gonna see people deadlifting, you're gonna see all these things. And those are all fine and dandy and those are gonna get you strong. Those are the basics, right? And everyone's gonna do those. Mm -hmm. But the way you coach those and the way you implement those is what makes coaching, coaching. Right. Um, you know, well, and, and in softball you have, you have the different body types. So it's not a, uh, a body type specific sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can deal with everything here. So the, the late great Mark Campbell and Mike Stith have given you this kind of open platform, yep. which kind of been a little bit renovated here recently, yep. right? Yep. Maybe more platform yep. or more space. But even as you look behind us, yep. it's not all these apparatuses and different things. You've got tools and you've got different things that you use to enhance training, but this yes. open floor work is really kind of where you do a lot of your work. Yeah, I mean, I, I love open floor. And like, you know, um, like, like we talked the other day, I heard someone talking on a podcast, Corey Schlesinger, who's the strength coach for the Phoenix Suns now, was a strength coach at Stanford for uh, men's basketball and golf. Um, but he said, you know, hey, what would be the best thing to do with the division one strength, like in industry, right? And he said, take the weight room away. And he said, if you can make your athlete a better athlete without a weight room, then you're a good coach. Right. You, you know, there's so many different things that you can do with an open floor, a wall, something like that, that doesn't have to be a dumbbell, it doesn't have to be a barbell. Right, we can skip, we can hop, we can jump. We can do all these fundamental movements that the body should be able to do that somehow across the developmental of a human, we lose the ability to do some of these things, right? right? What's the first thing you learn to do as a kid? You crawl, right? right? Well, a lot of times now I ask a 15, 16, 17 year old kid, even older, sometimes 20, whatever, to crawl and they, they, don't, they don't understand what I'm asking them to do. It's like, oh, well, how do I do that? Right. And I'm like, that was the first thing you learned how to do. Right, right. Why can't we do well, it Well, it's interesting how we talk about how, you know, it just in the evolution of life, you start off as an infant, kind of curled up, 
you know, crawling, boom, and then you go through life and you're very functional, but then as we get older, we kind of go back to those yeah. things. So even athletically, don't forget the ability to crawl again. And we'll exactly, talk a little exactly. bit more about that. But I think the point that I want to make to coaches and players out there too is don't forget that it's constantly changing. It's constantly progressing, like the industry itself. So again, yes. the term dynamic, but you know, you can get used. I mean, calisthenics still apply somewhere, jumping jacks and different things like no. that. But I think that's something that I really appreciate you because every time I look over here, he's not, he's not sitting around watching ESPN Sports Center. <laughs> Constantly reading. You're constantly yeah. like looking at things and you're, you're, you're yeah. investing in your own craft was something that I appreciate as well too. So are there one or two things that stand out that, that even like we just said, get rid of the weight room. Someone might go, what? Like, yeah. And there is a weight room here, yeah. and, but we were going to talk about how you use it. But yes. are, and I don't want to necessarily call them myths, but what are some of the other changes or some things happening? We were talking a little bit about even training pole to poles when pitchers run, you know, yes. right field pole to left field pole. Yeah. So are there a couple of things in just in your recent educating yourself that you just realized, man, things are changing. You know, I mean, I, I think one of the big things that we see, especially with where we work here, we work with a lot, a lot of young kids all the way up from nine years old, all the way up to pro and Olympians and things like that. But I see one of the biggest things that I think has changed over the years, it's still kind of thought to be true by some parents and some coaches, is the fact that, you know, lifting weights at a young age is, is harmful to the human body, right? It's gonna stunt their growth. Or, oh, it's gonna hurt them. Well, yeah, I mean, anything could hurt anyone, right? But if it's done properly and done in the right way, it's gonna be a benefit to that person. Which right? I'm generally assuming not overloading them, right? Not exactly. overloading with weight. Exactly, so, right. and I mean, so we get you know, parents or uh, coaches that come in all the time, and they're like, oh, well, you know, is it safe for my, my 10-year-old to be lifting? And I'm like, absolutely, Ab absolutely. But it has to be done the right way. Right. And like, you know, I've told you before, the way we run our programs is our younger kids, our nine, our 10, even 11-year-olds, you know, they're not going to be having a bar on their back right away. We're right. going to make sure that they understand what they're doing and can squat with just their body weight, like, right. like a little baby. You watch a baby squat, they have the best squat in the world. Right. You know, can they squat 500 pounds? No. Right. But they have good mechanics. And right. some, like, and like with the crawling, it's, we lose somehow that ability over the years because we don't do it enough. Yeah. Um, and I think it just becomes not, in my opinion, we, we don't think about it until our feet hurt. Yeah. Until we lose something. Yeah. Then, then we're in uh, physical therapy, exactly. we're in rehab, right? But this is kind of staying ahead of the curve. I can tell everybody here, one of the first things that you notice when you come and you watch the students at DA, and especially the younger ones, is you instantly notice that they are proficient in what they're doing. So proficiency is an ability to understand what they're doing. So they're not just following directions. They're not just looking at their sheet and doing something. When you watch them go up to a bar, mm -hmm it's like they already understand the basic movements. And then one of the other things that I think uh, I, I really picked up on when I first started working in this facility is the way they help each other. Yes. The way an older player will walk up to a younger player and kind of help them. I think, you know, giving an athlete the opportunity to fail is the best way to let that athlete learn. Um, because if they don't fail, they're never gonna know what they did wrong. Or what, and sometimes like you know, Silent reps are the best because there may be some time where some kid didn't necessarily doesn't do something right, but I don't say anything because their body's figuring that so out. So you're giving them the freedom to explore. Exactly. Which a lot of well-intended <laughs> coaches, very well-intended, they just don't realize by, that by constantly correcting mm -hmm. and pointing out what someone's doing wrong, you make them very self-conscious. Yes. And they actually are on this tightrope, yep. like a, an emotional tightrope. Yep. They're afraid to make the mistake. Yep. Here... Make the mistakes. Exactly. You've got plenty Make of room. Make the mistakes. And, 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 you know, I don't want to say that we encourage making mistakes, but... You allow we, them. We allow them. And we don't get mad at them because it's part of life. Right. And not only in this part of life, but also in that part of life outside of here. Um, mistakes are going to be made and you got to learn from them. And the body learns the same way just as the mind does, you know, so... You know, for as ideal as it should be, we should be able to see that everywhere. You just don't see that everywhere. So I call it autonomy, right? They become yeah. very autonomous. They're, yeah. they're, they're running their own show. And I, and I think, you know, the other thing that kind of creates the dynamic that we have here is work with a lot of older girls too, 18, you know, girls that are going to college. And, and these younger girls that are 9 or 10, they're working out with their role model, right? You know, yeah. you, you, you have girls, you know, like T.R.A. Jennings or, you know, someone like that that works out here. And then you have these little 8, 9, 10-year-olds that, are like, are in love with her. You know, and it's T.R.A. Jennings. Oh, my gosh, I'm in the same building. I'm in the same class. 
With and they're working Jones. out with her. They're not just in her presence asking her for an autograph. Exactly. And so what a, what a powerful kind of transition for these younger players because mm -hmm. they start to mimic the behavior. Yeah. They start to watch how she trains. Exactly. Like the first time we saw a pro ball player, yeah. we realized they're not running all over the place as hard as they can. They're very efficient as far as their body movements. They know when to explode. Yeah. They know when to go hard. But, you know, in Major League Baseball, you're talking about 162 games, yeah. so it's not about 100% all the time. Well, and so those relationships are yeah. very important. Yeah, and I mean, those things they are influence. built, and they are built here, and those kids watch the way the older girls work out, and then, you know, it's cool for them to be able to say, hey, I, I work out the same facility as her. Well, how about you know? Tiara, which is just a 12, uh, 12 year uh, and under player here, right? Oh, and yeah, so yeah. So it I goes mean, by fast. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we see them from here, we see them grow up, and then we see them in college, and, but somehow they always come back. You know, when they're home for summer or home for Christmas, they're always back in the building working out, yeah. trying to trying to just get better. And that's the environment that we like to create here. Is, is it's it, it's a it's the home. Yeah. It, it it is your home. You know. Well, and not, we we use the term culture, but I think my my takeaway. So just on the other side of this fence is where we hang out. But my my takeaway is that it includes <laughs> there's inclusion for the younger players, and they're not just kind of doing physical things they don't understand. Yeah. They're actually more prepared watching Mike then kind of transition with his classes. Yeah. And you see the progression of, of how beneficial it is when you can start training them the right way at 12 and 13 years old. And they're not, less, they're not left out. It's really yeah. a really good progression, the way you'd want to see in school and, and academically. And so I, it's actually pretty cool. And, and, I, and I think the other thing to kind of piggyback on that is you have to, you have to somehow find a way to implement some fun. Because if you have a nine-year-old and you start talking technical things and telling them this, 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 they're going to get bored in their attention span. They're going to be looking at things in the sky and playing with butterflies. But at the same time, they're doing it with their friend and having a little bit of fun. Right. Um, and that's the other thing that we like to kind of encourage here is, yeah, we're going to get work done. We're going to get better. Yeah. But you can talk. Right. I'm not a drill sergeant. I'm not going to sit here and, and make you say, you know, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, you know. Right. I want you to have fun. Because well, I, would, I think that's a that's you know, a big point because if we just you want to get real about it, be, be honest about it. The term would be, well, do you, is is there are just a few meatheads in here, like bossing kids around and scaring them, and, <laughs> and so you look at Ethan. He's kind of an imposing guy. Yeah. He's a pretty big guy, and the voices are there. The command presence is there. <laughs> the the you see the alpha aspect of what you guys are doing, but the key is you look at the players, right? If the players are just quiet and nodding and just following, now you have a male dominant environment. And so that's not what we're about. We're trying to empower the young female. So we yes. are who we are, but in, in what we're trying to achieve, it's not about suppressing, it's about empowering. So you yeah. have to be able to build those relationships. So uh, last couple questions before we get into some demonstrations is, I see the experience that the kids seem to be having in here, but what's the feedback that you get from the players? What do they like about training here at DA? Because I want all <laughs> coaches to realize that culture in your environment doesn't have to be specific to this facility or a certain person. Mm -hmm. It's 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 the way that you're doing things. It's, yeah. the, it's the environment that you're creating. So what's some of the feedback and why do, why are these classes so filled up every day here and they're a packed and these kids love it? Um, you know, a lot of the feedback that, that we get is, is one, what we were just talking about the culture. It's the fun environment, you know. Um, you got music. Just, yes, we got music, of course. And you know, we play different things. It's not only, it's not only rap, it's not only country, it's everything. I know we make it a point as trainers, Ethan and I in general, um, make it a point to, Every time a girl walks in, we call them by their name. Um, and we're happy to see them. It's not like, oh, hey, what's going on? Right. It's, you know, we either yell their name or they walk through the door and, and it's like, hey, what's going on? Or, you know, we yell their name and then they're like, oh, wow. Maybe, they know they're here when yeah. they walk in. Or maybe it's a new girl that, you know, just came in for the first time on Monday and then we see her again on Thursday and you know her name automatically. And then they walk in, you call them by name and then they're like, oh, wow, they know my name already. Right. You know? That's something that we take really good pride in is knowing Absolutely. everyone's name that, that walks sure. in here. Right. Um, and I feel like you walk into other training facilities or other businesses and that's not always the case. So they, they actually feel a personal attachment because that's something that takes place in our industry as well. That man, it's great when you can have an instructor one-on-one, -on -one, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get used to that personal relationship, that personal attachment. And there's a lot of people that will, well, you see a lot more group training now, but 20 yeah. years ago, you didn't see a lot of it. And there were so many people that, you know, again, very understandably, they're attached to the personal relationship. Then their concern is when you go to four, six, 12, no. 20, that you lose the personal relationship. You, you guys don't really do that. No. And I mean, we make it a point to go to round, go around to every girl, every class, you know, whether it, it's it's me or someone else, one of our other trainers that does it. We go around and we, we say, hey, how you doing? How was your day? It's not all about training. It's not all about softball. It's, you know, we, we understand that these girls or these athletes spend a lot of time 
doing things in the cages and doing things on the field that sometimes they just want to talk about what they did over the weekend. Right. Um, and That's the socialization part of it, though, and they, and exactly. they enjoy that as well, too. And, and, and the camaraderie that they can have conversations with each other mm -hmm. and that even though they're competing against each other on the field, you know, hey, listen, there are some kids in here, uh, I mean, just the way the industry works. Sometimes they're one part of one program. Yeah. Next year, they're part of another program. <clears throat> year after that, they're back in this program. Like, it's just so that camaraderie that the players get to, yeah. to develop is very important. And I think that's well. another thing that kind of the feedback that we get is it's fun for these girls to come here and work out with someone that's not in the same organization as they are. You know, anyone in any organization can come and work out here. It's so not, it's not a, a, a bat buster club and it's like you're not welcome because you know we're gonna take care of business on the field. I mean, that's Yeah, and we, and we want that because yeah, they're competitive on the field, but they're also friends outside right. of softball. And then right. they come in here and then it's a little bit of that competitive nature because it's like, hey, we play on a different team, but we're sure. really good friends. Sure. But I'm gonna kick your butt in a sprint. Sure. You know, and I mean, we, we you know, if we do have a group of a, a larger group of a class, we'll split them up by age group. You know, and like one trainer will take one group, one trainer will take another group. That way, we can kind of tailor the workout towards that age group. Because if right. we keep them all together, we have tens, we have twelves, we have sixteens, eighteens, fourteens, all together in the same group. Ten-year girls Different. aren't going to be able to do what the eighteen right. years. So, do we dumb down to a ten-year level for right. the eighteen-year, right. or do we? throw the 10 U's off to the side and go to the 18 U's. Right. It doesn't work like that. Right. But sure. at the same time, it's also a little bit important to keep them together sometimes too. Sure, sure. Um, because the, the then, integration, right. Because then the 10 U's can watch the 18 U's. Right. Sure. And, be, oh, and they can mimic they kind of like almost like a dance. And we talk about this a lot. Like they're watching someone dance. They can mimic that. I think <clears> we talk to our coaches a lot about understanding right brain and left brain, right? So if you understand right brain, your creative side, your fun side, that's recess, right? When the kids are out there in elementary school, they still have recess, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, they haven't completely eliminated. Not recess, yet. I mean, it's probably going there. You know, but tetherball, kickball, you know, you don't yeah. have someone instructing you. Just going out there and running. Right, right brain is not the analytical side. It's not how you do something piece by piece. You look at the 16s and 18s, they can be more involved in the process. They can break some yeah. of those things down, but it's not healthy to put kids that are too young in left brain and start analyzing all the time because that fun component is what feeds, inspires, and influences them to want to do things later on down the road. You know, you may have fun playing a sport and realize you do want to be a pro basketball player, mm -hmm. pro baseball player. Later on down the road, you're going to learn all the intricacies and things that you have to know, even the social political side of it. Yeah. My gosh, you don't need to know that as a nine year old, <laughs> you know, and at nine, a college or a little league world series just took place. You know, you got a lot of mimicking. You got a yeah. lot of modeling as far as what they see on TV and exactly. stuff like that. But I think exactly. that's important too. How about if we just, last thing I want to talk about before we get into some demos is, so a typical workout here mm -hmm. is uh, about an hour long? About, yeah. About an hour. And Give so typically take. they're going to come in and where's it, where's it going to start? And then where's it going to take them? And we'll describe it now and then we'll do a little walkthrough with the camera as far yeah. as like where, where uh, the st different stations are. But so um, like? you walk into the building, obviously we'll probably, yell, you, we'll probably yell your name or do something funny and make you feel welcome and just, you know, get you going. And then uh, when the class starts, we'll always start with uh, kind of a uh, warm up. We start with some ground based stuff. Um, and then we kind of stand you up, ground-based stuff being um, some hip mobility, some core activation, some glute activation, things like that where we're laying on the ground. We get familiar with the ground a little bit. Um, okay, so real quick now, I don't want to get too deep down this rabbit hole, but th those are all the, for those of you that have ever done like, and understood the term like pelvic tilts and things like that, right? Those are all the things a lot of times you experience in physical therapy when you've had a back injury, right? And then someone needs to explain to you the importance of neutral spine and kind of mm -hmm. what's happening with your spine and things yep. like that. Not always the most glamorous, right? So I always talk about, listen, we love our softball dads, but a lot of times it's the fastball, it's the home run, yep. you know, how fast can you run? What can you do with the weight? But yep. you start taking these kids and put them against the wall, start understanding how their hips move, yep. how they're two pieces in the hips. Yep. Like it's pretty interesting to watch because you don't lose them. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a tough thing to do. I mean, it is a tough thing to do. It's tough to take a 12-year-old kid and teach them these things and not lose their, lose, lose their focus. But that's why we only do one set of it. Right. But we do it every day. Keep it in short, a short burst. But we do so they do day. have an understanding, a little bit of taste. But you're talking an hour session, maybe 10 minutes? It maybe, you know, if that, you yeah. know, it's one set of this, let's do it. But then it's one set of this, one set of this. We do five sets total of five different things, right? One set for each thing. But then they're like, okay, well, okay, that was only five minutes, you know, whatever. And then, but we do that same thing the next day. Because right. they're not going to get it all the first time. The little by day. little, they're going to become maybe more it's a little bit of a different variation. Right. But we microdose it throughout the week. Right. You know, we're not spending 20, 30 minutes and 10 sets on this pelvic tilt drill because 
kids aren't going to do that. And I know that the workouts are different, but then, okay, so from the floor. So from the floor, then we stand them up. We get them moving a little bit. We kind of get their heart rate up. We'll take them through a little bit of dynamic warm up. Whether we always kind of start with um, just some basic movement patterns, skips, uh, you know, maybe some crawling, some rolling, um, some hopping, some, you know, single leg hopping, you know, just get their bodies moving a little bit. And then once we kind of go through that, then we'll take them through more speed mechanic type stuff with our marches, our more kind of um, technical A skip variations, things like that. And then at the end of the warm up, we'll let them move fast. We'll, we'll have them do some sub maximal sprints at the end of the warm up, maybe from some different starting positions, whether they're on their stomach, their back, their side, four point, three point, two point. Um, all kinds of different things just to, you know, let their bodies experience generating force from different positions because you're never going to generate force from the same position in your sport. You're so they're getting, so they're getting the floor work here. Now you're working into their, their, and so their now sprint I, work. And so now after we kind of get the more technical side of the warm up done, then, you know, they'll get some water. We'll come back out. Now we'll do our speed or our agility, our change of direction, our lateral acceleration work for the day. Um, and that kind of fluctuates throughout the week between linear acceleration, lateral acceleration, change of direction, depending on what day of the week, what day of the month you come. We try to get put it on a schedule so everyone gets a little bit of everything because we are dealing with field sport athletes and we need every athlete to kind of get a wide array of those things. You know, we can't just work on linear acceleration because we're not track athletes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're field sport. We, right. we, we've got to understand that our body moves in all three planes of motion at all times. Sure. Um, so we'll go through our speed or agility for the day, spend about 10, 15 minutes on that. And then the rest of the time is them getting into the weight room and lifting some weights. Um, you know, the older kids will kind of, you know, get underneath the bars, lift some heavier weights, depending on what time of the year we're at. Um, and then the younger kids will grab their laminated sheet and they'll, you know, grab their lighter weights or their body weights and they'll get their workout done. And um, as we take a look in your weight room, it's not 20 different types of machines no there's, there's you're not going to see a... you're not going to see whether it's on our floor as you can see behind me it's a big open space we don't have a lot of uh, fancy things fancy bands and fancy machines that we're going to hook people up to it's it, it's learning to move correctly and building your athleticism same thing in our weight room we have eight squat racks we have um you know a dumbbell rack from fives up to 75s um, we have some bands we have some bars we have some plates it's all very basic stuff um, but I think what you just said is, well. is, a, is a key takeaway, and that is that you're teaching them to move correctly, so understanding it, not just programming them, and then they're becoming better athletes. Yeah. And that's always been a fixture of the Bat Buster program, yeah. right? So between the mentality that they learn and the competitive edge that they get with Coach Mike, mm -hmm. but then you see a better trained athlete. There's lots of people that train but you can't necessarily tell that they train, right? Yeah. And so it's, the, it's that efficiency of that work. And so, so it progresses from just kind of concept stuff to speed work and agility <clears throat> stuff, and then ends up in the, uh, in the weight room, which again, I walk by that and I look in the window all the time, and they're having a good time in there. Yeah, they all work hard, they all understand what they're doing, but they have fun as they do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that we, as a staff here at Dynamic uh, Athletics, we encourage that. We, we, we encourage the kids to have fun because if they don't have fun, they're probably not gonna get the best out of it. You know, a lot of people have heard the term from the ground up, yes. right? Like everything starts from the ground up, but you took it a little more specific. So today specifically, what we'll do is we'll kind of intro the concept now and then we'll do some demonstrations, yeah. but we're talking about the big toe. If yep. it's one toe you don't want to lose. It's the big toe. It's your big toe, it's the big toe, right? But tell me about the big toe and kind of its importance in athleticism and, and actually function as you just get older, period. Yeah, I mean, the big toe in general, I mean, it's, it's your balance point. Um, I mean, if you don't have your big toe, you're gonna have trouble walking, jumping, running, uh, just going about everyday life um, because that toe is very important in what you do. Um, so just to kind of get a little bit more in depth with that, it's like, you know, hey, a lot of people don't understand their feet in general. Um, it's, hey, yeah, I have a foot, but that's all you know about your foot is it's right. down there and it hits the floor and it keeps you upright, right. right? But for some people, does it really keep you upright? I don't know. I mean, you know, so like we talked about the other day, if you're, you're, your foot is made, it should be a hand. Right, your hand and your feet should be very similar. You should be able to do the same things with your foot that you can do with your hand. 
right? You should be able to grab things. You should be able to move the hand in, or the foot kind of uh, individually. You should be able to move each individual toe. You should be able to move those things independent of, of, of the other one. And a lot of times you sit someone down, you take their shoes off. For one, a lot of people don't like feet. And they say, oh, you want me to take my shoes off? I'm like, yeah, I want you to take your shoes off. And they get all freaked out, but they get over that too. But, um, and then you take their shoe off and then you look at this foot that's supposed to be a foot and it looks like a paddle. And I'm like, what if, what is it that happens to our feet? And you're, and you're talking about younger players too, but yeah. I'm thinking of, you know, our, our 15 audience members are our, our, our coaches and, you know, parents out there that are, are in charge of these kids, right? But what is it that happens to our feet as we get older and, and it just kind of morphs and the, and the toes morph and so, depending I mean, on the shoes that you're wearing yeah. and then it becomes almost like a brick or a block as we get older yeah. and it loses its, what we call dexterity, right? Yes. And I mean, you know, the big thing that is the culprit of that is, is, the, is the shoe. Is, is the shoe. We, we spend so much time in shoes nowadays that these shoes are, are formed to have a little bit of a pointed toe and take your toes and cram them all together like this, right? But in reality, your toes should be spread. We should be able to use the toes for, for balance or for whatever it is we may be doing. Um, but now my big toe sits underneath my, my middle toe and my big toe, it's like you don't even have it, right? Um, so, so for I you think, conspiracy theory people, I'm looking at the shoe manufacturers. What are, what are they trying to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, your toes are overlapping. It's all what? what and the you know, I mean, there it? are there are some good shoe companies out there now that are having a wider toe box and things like that. That are shoes that I recommend with the flatter sole. Um, but those things we'll get into in a little bit, possibly. But but you know what's um, interesting about our society, real quick, is that just the way our society is, right? A lot of people would rather look good and stylish yeah. at the expense of their toes and feet. Yeah. You know, how and many times have you seen someone wear a shoe out for a night on the town or something, and by the end of the night, there's a big old blister on yeah. the foot or whatever, but would look good. Yeah, hey, you look good. I'm not talking about anybody in, uh, in particular, but you know who you are. <laughs> it, it, hey, it, it's about how you look, not necessarily about how you perform. Well, and we're in that kind know? of society, so yeah. how can you bring back the information of, okay, but hey, not only are you neglecting your your kind of deforming a little bit yeah. and you're, you're, you're gonna hurt yourself down yeah. the road, right? Yeah, you know, it's like taking a, you know, something to put around your neck and all of a sudden your neck gets really long. We don't need that. Well, how, what's the culture? Uh, it's a tribal culture where they yeah. wear the rings and then eventually the neck is like, boom, boom. Yeah. So really our, our bodies really do morph and kind of progress with what we're doing. Yeah. So going, going back to the athlete, yep. um, the big toe is really, really important, especially it, your ability to Bend it, bend right? It. Losing, not um, losing that flexibility. So, I mean, if you, if you look at the foot and you look at, you know, sprinting, jumping, um, crawling, whatever it is, the big toe has to bend. If, if the big toe does not bend, it does not bend backwards, then you're going to be losing that extra little bit of that push on your sprint or that, that push on your jump or whatever that may be. And you come to, you know, if you look at it, I've obviously seen a lot of athletes with this problem. Um, and the athletes range in age from nine years old all the way up to my professional people that I work with. I've seen it at both levels and across that spectrum from, from, from small to big and young to old. Um, and in my opinion, I think that's a big issue is, is you, these, you have these people that have this, this thing on the end of their leg that they call their foot. And then you have this, these things on the end of their foot they call their toes. But to me, it all is just one thing because they can't move it independently. Sure. They, they, they can't move their foot. Their foot doesn't glide and slide. Your foot has the most bones and joints and ligaments in your whole body, yeah. right? It's crazy. Your right. phalanges and your tarsals and your yeah. metatarsals. And, and your... if one of those joints in your foot doesn't necessarily glide or slide the way it should, then that could cause your ankle, your knee, your hip, your low back to be in pain. Well, and somebody out there might have uh, had the experience of a chiropractor like popping either the, yeah. the talus or anything like that. And you don't realize that there, there, there are a lot of bones, it's like your wrist, there are a lot of bones in your foot. So, so how about this? We're gonna clear the chairs out and then let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about okay. going back to the infancy okay. days of crawling and kind of what happens yeah. with, the, with the big toe. All right, let's sound good? Yeah. All right, let's, let's do it. it.